that I know that we are going to worship our God like this tent is full. So I would also encourage you, if you would like, to come a little closer. A little closer. That would be nice. Um, but no pressure. You also obviously all are just free to do what you'd like. This has been a tent that has created really good conversation, has challenged us, and has made us refocus on just loving Jesus and loving one another. And I love that. And I love that especially because I'm wearing my shower shoes right now. I've got no makeup on, I've got my bunny ears on to keep the kids entertained. But that we just love each other no matter what no matter where we are, no matter what we look like, where we come from. And that has been our challenge this week, to be reminded of that as well and to come back to the heart of worship. It is really lovely to have you all here. I'm sure people will continue to trickle in as we uh, worship our God. We're going to just keep singing. I was loving packing my tent and just worshipping as we were listening to this beautiful music. So let's do that. I also want to acknowledge those of you online. We hope you've got your, your cup of coffee and your, you're ready to worship with us from home as well. My phone is charged today, I'll have you know. So I will do the acknowledgement of country correctly today. Today we acknowledge our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge you, Lord, because you are the creator, provider and supreme owner of all things. We also respectfully acknowledge the Jar Jar Wurring people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay tribute to elders past, present, and acknowledge that they have cared for this country over countless generations. We recognize the continuing contribution that the Wurundjeri people make to the life of this region and pray we can work together to leave a legacy of reconciliation, justice, and hope for all future Australians. Moi. Thank you, Haley. Can you please put your hands together for our amazing host for this weekend? I called her and I said, Haley, my love, can you be our face and our person to lead us as our host for camp? And she's like, I've got surgery on my finger on Thursday morning, but yes. And so thank you for your yes. Um, I said to her, she has the gift of reading the room and know when things need to just be pivoted and things to maybe just change a little. She just, she's an empath. And that is a gift and a curse. Um, but we are so grateful for that gift, my girl. I've known Haley since she was little, so I am that person. And so I love seeing what God has done with her and through her. And we're grateful that you have blessed us this weekend. And honestly, if there's a guy out there that's not willing to lay down their lives, like Auntie Dillis said, get away. Yeah, Auntie Dillis said it. So all the aunties and all the uncles, you remind her. Okay, uh, we love you. Guys, um, again, this weekend, God has shown up. We knew that God was going to show up. We just didn't know how he was going to show up. And so would you put your hands together for God, Holy Spirit and Son. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Um, this would not have happened without the incredible, incredible work of the team that you have seen and unseen. Um, often, our sound and our visuals and our tech people get forgotten, but I don't forget them because I am telling you a thousand times over, I've said to them, you have no idea how many gray hair you have saved me this weekend. So please put your hands together for Bryce and for Alex. Um, and you are hired for next year and you're not allowed to quit on us. Um, so thank you again for your professionalism, for showing up, for also being really nice, sound people. For those that know, know, right? Okay, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Last night I invited our pastoral team up and then my ADHD undiagnosed brain 
actually forgot to even tell you their names and which churches they represent. So if you are here from Mildura, please put your hands together for your pastor. But everybody put your hands together for, Mil for Mladen, for Mildura Church. If you are from Ballarat, please put your hands together for John and Heather, who have been an incredible team uh, and loved it. And also, if you are from NCC, we've had Lani Edwards, we've had Je uh, Jeremiah um, as part of our team who's led our coffee and then our volunteers behind the coffee machine. Um, if you are from Burwood Church, Jared Smith has been incredible. Uh, where is Jared? And we have Kylie and Laura that have served us. Um, and then, of course, we've had Miroslav from Seddon Church. But, of course, he's been, um, he's not here with us right now. But please pray for his family, um, for wellness and health uh, for Anna as well. Um, who have I forgotten? Ben, Atavao. How do I forget my brother from WA? who's landed and now joined the team and he's been our driver and our muscle as well. Ben and Gabby who are cooking breakfast. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then of course, come on, come on. Thank you, thank you. Have you worshiped this weekend? Have you been taken into the presence of God this weekend? For all of you who are uncomfortable with all the feelings, but yet this weekend God has moved you through words of song, the intentionality of the songs that have been chosen, the messages through the songs that you don't want to say because it's too confronting. Thank you. Thank you. So please put your hands together for our worship team. Let's pray as they lead us. Father God, you are an incredible God. And as we wrap up this weekend, 2024 Big Camp here in Elmore with all the dust. Father God, thank you for the stirring of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gift of Dillis and the team that has made this possible. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done behind the scenes, the ways in which you have protected and also the ways in which you have given us patience uh, with the in-between things. Thank you for the ways in which you have shown up. Father, thank you. So as we worship you together as a family here in Victoria, before we go to our respective churches and locations. May you be worshipped this morning. May you receive our offering, God, because you are worthy of praise and honour. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All right. Thank you, Moy. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you are ready to sing for the last time in this building um, this morning. So I want to ask you to please stand as we worship our God together.
Searching 
Father God, soon we will be traveling home to our homes to implement and live faith and love that you have given us. But not just yet. This hour we are still in worship space. We have been singing together. We have touched our souls, our hearts. And Dillis will come here in a second and bear her heart to us and to you as well. Place upon her a burden of truth and love and direct her mind and mouth. May she be your prophet today. May she speak as you ask her to what speak. And may she be also renewed as we are. Thank you that you are with us now. And thank you that you will encourage us so that when we do go home and we go out to go to our workplace, we go to our communities, that we continue to have the heart of worship, heart that is accepting, that is involving, inclusive, and that invites to you our Father who is so amazing. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy of everything we have, everything we are, of our life and our time. And let us show this. Let us show this. And now we invite Elise. Bless her and guide her. This pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are the remnant. I am so excited to be in this space with you this morning as we conclude our time together. Um, <laughs> let's just jump right in because I want to use all the time. Um, we are in Ephesians chapter 6. We have spent this entire weekend going through from a 60,000 foot um, level view, looking down on what Paul says to the church, the Ephesian church. Several years after he has spent time laboring with them and exposing them and teaching them about Jesus. As we walk through chapters one through six this weekend, I just want to refresh your memory on what Paul has been saying to them and to us. Paul starts off by just glorifying God that these individuals who were Gentiles have been brought into the kingdom of God, have come into the knowledge and understanding of Jesus and the gospel. Jesus, uh, Paul uh, reminds them that there used to be a separation between those who God made a covenant with the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and themselves, the Gentiles, everybody else in the world. The plan that God had put in place thousands of years before was that one family would become the ambassadors, the emissaries to the world to reveal who God was. We've talked about the fact that God continues to use messy human beings, people who are absolutely incapable of getting it right, of doing it right, and this is a reflection of God's heart of love because he created us in the image of God and will not abandon us to ourselves. And so Paul reminds them, there used to be a dividing wall between those who were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those who belong to that great company of humanity called Gentiles. But Jesus comes, breaks down the barrier, joins them together, and they are now a new humanity. Jesus comes to show us what it means to be human, how to really be human. What a God we serve that takes on the responsibility of demonstrating to us how we can be the best versions of ourselves. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that Jesus becomes the cornerstone around which the entire uh, new humanity, this church, is built. 
We are being built, we are growing, and we are being transformed. We are taking off the old and putting on the new. We are one new humanity. We are unified in our purpose, but not necessarily uniformed in our practice. Because God wants people to know that everybody belongs. Last evening, we looked at Paul's treatise about transformation, that as a result of us coming into this new humanity, we're going to take off old ways of being and put on new ways of being. We, we also discovered that we all coming into the family of God receive not just the Son, but the Father and the Spirit, and we receive the ability to do different things in the name of Christ in order to build up the church. The way we used to be, Paul says, don't be like that anymore. Change your ways. And we talked about the fact that the reason we are changed is so that those who come in contact with us will know that God is real and that God exists. My notes. We talked about the fact that the spirit is finally in the game. The spirit is at work in us, transforming us. And that as a result of the relationship with God, Father, and Son, we ought to be the kinds of people that are always singing and encouraging one another with psalms, songs, and spiritual songs. We're supposed to be singing together in worship and alone. We ought to give thanks for everything. And as a result of the Spirit, we are compelled to be the kinds of people who elevate others above ourselves. I asked my daughter last night if what I said made sense, and she was like... Yeah, but that marriage thing kind of lost on me. (laughs) She said, I eventually figured it out. And so I wanted to go back there to finish up this morning. Paul uses the Christian household as an example of this respect and and, and, um, and surrender. Respect and submission model. So we talked about it. Wives respect, husbands love. What does that love look like? It's sacrificial the way that Jesus did. So then when Paul talks to um, the children here in chapter 6, at the beginning of chapter 6, here we go, slide. He tells our children to obey their parents in the Lord, for it is right, to honor their father and their mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Do you see it? It's the same thing. Children obey. Children respect. And the children are going to obey and respect when their parents are the kinds of people who will lay down their lives for their children. Are are you seeing that? Then Paul goes on and says, fathers, daddies, don't provoke your children to anger. What is it about us? Um, In the the black community, we, we, we have this thing about how sometimes children get to a certain stage of life where they start smelling themselves. I don't know if you understand what that analogy means. You're smelling yourself. You act like you're grown. You think you're grown. So you talking to me any kind of way. You know, you're like, take that bass out your voice when you talk to me. Because <laughs> I'm still your daddy. I'm still your mom, right? I had a friend in college who his mother was like maybe five foot one. And he turned six two. And she said, boy, bring me that chair. And she climbed on the chair. And she said, don't think about it. <laughs> right? So there's this idea that fathers and mothers, when we get, when our children get to that stage of life where they start to flex, where they start to test whether or not the things we say we really mean, when they start to articulate their voices, Paul says, don't don't get them angry. Listen to them. Again, submit, serve. Because when the family of God At home in the nuclear family, not nuclear, but whatever your family looks like, right? When that family is following this respect, submission, respect, submission model, it changes the community. It's not just for us. It's for bearing witness about what this new humanity looks like. And the last relationship that Paul speaks about is the one between slave and master. And I told you. That if we're looking at it in our recent history, we're going to get it confused. What Paul is saying here is radical for everyone in the Greco-Roman world. Because if the master is being asked to submit to his slave, does he have a slave anymore? He does not. So for us, when we're reading it or hearing it today, 
we will get in our feelings, which is appropriate because we ought to argue and talk and engage with the text. But do not lose the fact that what Paul is asking the Ephesian church to do is countercultural. So in the year of our Lord, 2024, everything about the church must also be countercultural. Amen, floors. So here we are this morning in Ephesians chapter 6 to the part that I'm super hyped about. Verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. I wish I had some people who were interested in the great controversy in the house this morning. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and have done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having guarded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Do you see that the fight is fixed? Do you understand we already win? So why are we not showing up with our armor? Why aren't we armoring up? Perhaps the reason we struggle with armoring up is because we only see the gospel message from an individual lens. We spend our lives thinking about whether we're saved, whether our children are saved. We Don't understand that we are saved by faith, through grace. It is a gift that God has given to us. And so we keep working and working and trying to make ourselves be okay. And when that's not working, we police everybody else around us to make sure they're okay so we can feel like we're okay. But that is not the assignment. What is the assignment? The new humanity is to become a living temple, bearing witness of the gospel. What is the gospel? That God became human, lived among us to show us what it looks like to be human. Then he fulfills the covenant that he made with Abraham, paid the price for our inability to be faithful. Not only did he do that, He went in the grave and rested, and then he got up and conquered hell, death, and the grave so that we who believe could have access to it, not because we deserve it, but because it's a gift. I wish you could earn it. I wish I could earn it. I wish I could act the way I'm supposed to act all the time based on what you think I should do. I wish I could. And I'm so glad that that's not the assignment. Do you catch what Paul is saying? You and I belong to the new humanity. We belong to a community that we refer to as church. In this community called church, we mimic, we follow what Jesus does. How does Jesus move in the world? Who does Jesus take care of when he's on the planet? Where does Jesus go? How does Jesus respond to the systems that are in place? Does he sit at home and have people waiting on him? Is he worrying about his brothers and sisters and them? You remember that Jesus is busy healing folk and his mama comes to get him with his brothers? You remember that story? And they're like, go get Jesus. Tell him his mama's here. Because his mama's coming to get this grown man. Because she says something wrong. With, the whole family's like, something wrong with him. Do you hear what he's doing? He's out here casting out demons. He's out here healing people. He's out here feeding people. Go get the boy. We ain't raised him like that. 
my girlfriend would say, he don't have any act right. <laughs> he's out here confronting the scribes, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law. He's out here, people calling him a rabbi, go get him. He is embarrassing the family. <laughs> ah, go get the boy. <laughs> so mom comes with the brothers, and what is Jesus' response? Who is my mother? <laughs> ah, listen. <laughs> Because a sister like me would like, say that again. <laughs> say that again. He's like, who's my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? What is the response? Those who do the will of my father. What is the will of the father? To take care of people. We have lost our way. Because we think the church's responsibility is to be the church. We are like the scribes and the Pharisees. We are so concerned with getting it right that we are doing the same thing. You remember what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees? You will go to lengths to go get somebody converted. You pass all the people at home that need to know about God's love. You go far away, overlooking what's in front of you, mm. so you can feel good. You will tithe mint and cumin, so you don't have to take care of your parents. Mm. You see women and children and pray like, I'm so glad I'm not a woman, mm. oh. in the presence of God. Uh. When you see poor people, you puff up your chest, and you walk over, and you blame them for their conditions. Well. Forgetting completely that in the kingdom of God, there is abundance. There's food for everybody. Mm. There's resources for everybody. Why? Because we give away what we have. And when you give away, you get back. Mm. Listen, you want to come back to the heart of worship? And we're spending all this time beating up ourselves, self-flagellating ourselves about what we didn't do and what we didn't say and how wrong we are? Stop it. You read what Paul says. The new humanity, our assignment is to war against the systems of this world. But we don't want to war against the systems of this world because we don't believe they exist Mm. because it hasn't happened to me. So as long as it hasn't touched my house, then it's not my concern. Mm. Wrong family. Mm. Because in the human family that Jesus has come to create and who, that he inaugurated and wants to continue to breathe life into, it is always concerned with every image bearer mm. of God. Yeah. You think I'm, t- I'm, I'm making this up? Huh, L- let's look at this. When you think of spiritual warfare, what comes to mind? And you need to talk back to me. Demons. You think about demons. Anybody else in the room, when you think spiritual warfare, you think about demons? Depression. Depression. So, disease. Oppression. Oppression. When you say oppression, what do you mean? Okay. Anybody else? Anxiety. Traitor in yourself. Temptation. Me, me, me. Somebody said me, me, me. Okay, I think we would agree that there is some connection there. Um, however, I would like to enliven, broaden our understanding of spiritual warfare. How many of you, let's tell on ourselves, when you think about demons, you're shooketh? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You'll get... <laughs> I made, up a, I made up a King James version of a word. <laughs> and I use a colloquial term. Sorry. How many of you, when you think of demons, you become afraid? I said shooketh. <laughs> right? When we think about demons, we become afraid. Why? Because of how we've been taught. 
every time a demon came in the presence of Jesus, how did the demon act? Jesus, for real, bruh. (laughs) Could you, like, I mean, I know who you are, but uh, could you just not, like, displace me? And Jesus is like, shh, get out. (laughs) I don't want everybody to know who I am. You know who I am. I know you know what I know. Just go. So how is it that the body of Christ is shooketh over demons? (laughs) Could it be all the movies we watched? Could it be all the interpretations of scripture that are not fully reflective of the scripture? And too many stories. So demons don't have any power over us. They already know who's in charge. And their response is, "Mm, our time is limited. And Jesus says, if we have mustard seed faith, What can't we accomplish? So, demons don't have any power. I noticed that when we talked about things that shake us or cause us to, what we refer to as spiritual spiritual warfare, we named several emotional wellness or mental health challenges because we often spiritualize things and then we question the veracity of medical diagnosis and definitions because we've been taught to be suspicious of them. Right? So we name everything, we make everything spiritual. Depression, spiritual, no. Go talk to Jeremiah about depression. Mm. Go talk to Elijah after he called down fire from heaven and destroyed the sons of Baal And he was exhausted because that was exhausting. And he goes and runs ahead of the chariot. The rain comes and Jezebel is like, I wish you would be alive tomorrow night. I wish you would go to sleep. I wish you would. You're going to be dead. Elijah was shooketh. (laughs) So what does Elijah do? He runs. And before he can go, the Lord finds him and puts him to sleep. Angel comes, wake up, wakes your boy up, feeds him, tells him to rest some more. In the strength of the food he got, he ran how many days? Forty. Runs up in a mountain somewhere where God meets him. And God says to him, why are you here, my guy? Like, why are you here? What happened? What? <laughs> you don't know Jezebel? <laughs> I was the only one. I was the only one left, and I stood up to her. And then she said she was going to kill me. (laughs) Elijah was shooketh. Elijah was anxious. Elijah was stressed. And God had just used the man of God to do something amazing. Stop believing that two things can't happen at the same time. That you can't be scared and be happy at the same time. That you cannot be anxious and still hopeful at the same time. We can hold two emotions at the same time. And what is God's response to our boy Elijah? (sighs) I got 4,000 prophets (laughs) who have not bowed to Baal. There you go again, like a good human, making it all about you. Because you tell yourself, I'm the only one. Church people, this is why we testify. That's why we tell our stories so that people know that they're not the only one. And then the Lord says, go ahead and anoint Elisha and come on, you're retired. (laughs) You want to talk about depression? Go talk to Jeremiah. He is called the what? The weeping prophet. Mm. You want to know about depression? Go read Lamentations. And yet in the middle of it, he goes, it is because of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. You want to talk about depression? Go talk to your boy David, Asaph, Korah. Mm. God, don't you see us out here? (laughs) Aren't you going to do something for us? 
But God, you're so faithful and so good. Wait a minute. Let me remember what you did in the past. It's not spiritual. It's part of our existence. But what are the spiritual being, beings or what's the spiritual warfare that exists in the world? Here's what I want to offer to you. There are three. They haven't changed. Money, sex, and power. These systems have been around and continue to be around. And as long as we are battling money, sex, and power individually, as long as that's what takes up our whole lives, we don't have to see the impact of the system Mm. on people, places. Isabel Wilkerson, in her book, The Warmth of Other Sons, traces the movement of black bodies from the South, Jim Crow South, Mississippi, Florida, Louisiana, to Oakland, California, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York. She traces what's called the great migration of black bodies from the dirty South because Jim Crow, which happened after the emancipation of black bodies from enslavement, there were systems in place that said whites only. You could get on a, a train in Florida as a black person and had to sit in certain cars, but by the time you passed a certain point, you could go anywhere you wanted. You know this for a fact, and if you don't, and then I want you to educate yourselves, that black men were called boys, yeah. grown men in Jim Crow South. That a black man could be hung for looking at a white woman. That's how Emmett Till died. He was 14. He was a little boy. That whole communities were burned to the ground because black people were successful. They weren't supposed to because the system said they weren't people. And the system that said they weren't people allowed them to be enslaved by people who said they loved the Lord. I'm talking about systems. So Isabel Wilkerson traces that. And then she writes another book called Cast. Because Isabel says, it's not just racism. It's not, it's more than just this colorism. And she points out by looking at three groups of people, Nazi Germany, the Dalits in India, and the black experience in America. And she says, The system in place is a system of caste. Somebody always has to be on the bottom. Somebody ought to get happy right now. Because in the system that is called the kingdom of heaven, nobody's on the bottom. So Isabel Wilkerson offers us an an invitation to start looking around you and seeing what does spiritual warfare look like? Yeah. It is the oppression yes. of people, yeah. period. Yeah. And whatever the system that is used to oppress others, we should identify them and name them and call them out. Why? Because Jesus came to inaugurate a new humanity. Yeah. And in his kingdom, the top becomes the bottom, and the bottom becomes the top. And nobody is trying to snatch or grab a whole power because we're always serving one another. Oh, I wish y'all would catch this. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I I joked about it with y'all earlier in the week. Today is Monday, right? It's Sunday where I come from. And yet, where I'm going to is dependent. I'm sorry. We are dependent on where I'm going to when it comes to finances. No? It's a system. My friend went to study with some women in the Yucatan Peninsula, Dr. Marlene Ferreras. And she went to see how the denim jeans that you and I love to wear, 
that the Mexican women who live in the Yucatan Peninsula no longer grow maize, corn, to feed their families because in maquiladoras, the companies that make the jeans that we love to wear have come there and said, we will pay you to make these jeans because we want it. The demand is so high. Mm. So it disrupts their whole community. She, one girl in particular that she talked to wanted to become a healthcare professional. But her dad said to her, you're not going to be able to do that. Instead, just go work at the factory so that we can eat. The factory isn't giving back to the community. No. It takes and it takes and it takes. All the immigrants in this room, mm. haven't you seen systems that have impacted the places you come from? Yeah. And what do we do as a new humanity? We don't push back against the system. Mm. We don't call the system to task because we say any day now Jesus is going to come yeah, and it's going to get better in the by and by. I'm so sorry to tell you that when Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of heaven is here right now. And he set up little, emb little embassies in every home, every little hamlet he went to, where people were declaring, come meet a man. Could this be the Messiah? He knew everything about me. Come meet him for yourself. When Paul speaks to the church in Ephesus, he's reminding them, armor up. Put on the armor that you need because you are not fighting against just your flesh. You, as a new humanity, are fighting against the systems that want to keep us fighting with one another, that want to keep us othering people that want to keep us hoarding our resources that want to keep us spending all that we have that want to keep us drinking from cisterns that are broken and cannot give us what we need because if the new humanity does not fight against the systems of this world then who will who's coming y'all Who's coming? There's nobody else coming. Jesus already came. Yeah. We are the church. Yeah. We are the response. When you look at what Paul says we are to put on, you can look in Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 52 and you will see that what Paul is pulling to our memory, if my thing would just open, one moment. That when Paul says we are to put on the armor of God, he is saying we are to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand. What is the armor of God? I'm so glad you asked. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. When you go and look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, and I wish you would, if you really want to know what the kingdom of heaven is like, read Matthew 5 through 7 over and over and over again, because that's the kingdom ethics. Anybody who says they follow Jesus should be living their lives in that way by the power of the Spirit, not ours. Matthew 5 through 7. So when you are putting on the breastplate of righteousness, it's not our righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness that we are putting on. He says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is it? Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come hear the good news. Come meet this. What do you need to do? Just believe in him. He has paid it all. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. There is room at the table for you. What have you done? I double dare you to tell me what you've done. And when you tell me what you've done, I'm going to tell you Jesus paid it all. I double dog, triple dog dare you to tell me what you're thinking of doing. And I'm going to tell you Jesus has already seen your future and he's already taken care of it in his blood. Just come as you are. The children of God look like this. When we would throw hands, we turn the other cheek. When you think you have your foot on our necks, 
We will walk the extra mile. Because we know that one of these days, our king is going to handle you. Yes. Yes. That's the great controversy. Mm. That's what you say you believe. Mm. And as long as you keep thinking the great controversy is about your individual problems, right. then you don't understand the God that we serve. Mm. Because God is sick and tired of the people who bear his image suffering on this planet. And we do and say nothing. And listen, don't, be, don't come for me. I'm not saying you personally are not doing anything. That's not what I said. Amen. Amen. The you is the plural you. All of us. In addition, take up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Where are all my Star Wars fans? <laughs> We've got it already, y'all. And here's the thing. The imagery that Paul is pulling for us here is for the reader. <laughs> this is why I love the Bible. Because every time you think you know something, the Spirit be like, let me show you more. <laughs> the imagery here is to cause us to remember that God is actually the one who will fight on our behalf. Yeah. You remember when the children of Israel were down in Egypt? And you remember when Moses went and said to Pharaoh, um, God said, y'all need to let us go. <laughs> and Pharaoh said, No. And, and Moses was like, no, you really want to let us go. <laughs> and Pharaoh was like, no. And Moses was like, okay, I warned you. And then God does a series of 10 things. Those enactments of God was God's judgment on Egypt for the choice it made to move from being in partnership with the descendants of Joseph and became owners, oppressors, and commodified them for the industry of Egypt. So let me tell somebody in the room who's wondering whether or not God has seen your plight. Baby, don't you worry. The Bible says that God says, let me handle the vengeance. Because when you do it, you are messy. You'll be taking everybody out. You want to take everybody out. Judgment will come. For some of y'all in this room, I'm going to tell you, I got you. I have sat in spaces and watched people prosper. Hello, somebody. And I almost lost my way like David. And then I remembered the spirit brought the word to me. David said, I almost lost my way and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. But then I went into the sanctuary and I remembered those of us who follow Jesus, we do what Jesus does. And those of us who follow Jesus, when we see people taking advantage of the word of Jesus to use it to hurt people, we hold them accountable. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ten plagues later, the last one being the death of the firstborn son. And for uh, Gen Zers in the room and the Al Gen Alphas, <laughs> you know, y'all getting your feelings about I can't serve a God. It's so vindictive. <laughs> I'm not making fun of you. <laughs> like, I'm, I really am not. I'm just saying this is what y'all say to me. <laughs> I got you. I understand that you struggle with this kind of God. And then I ask myself, maybe the reason you struggle is because you've never been oppressed. Yes. Wow. Well, come on. Come on. Because when you've never been oppressed, you cannot understand an oppressed person's need for deliverance. Yeah. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Yeah. This doesn't mean you're a terrible person. I'm just saying, if you don't understand what it feels like to be told you got to walk around to the other side of the building, did y'all watch Hidden Fig Figures, that movie? Oh, yeah. There's a scene in Hidden Figures where the black woman um, needs to do something, and she goes to the bathroom. And you know the space was majority male and white, right? 
And the guy's like, why are you taking so long to go to the bathroom? And she's like, what? What you mean? I can't go to the bathroom with you all white people. I got to go behind God's back and around the corner to find a bathroom. So you're going to write me up because it takes me so long to go to the bathroom when you forget that you are part of the system yeah. that is oppressing me. Mm-hmm. Why are you, why are you, why, why, Dillis, why you always see racism everywhere? I, what? <laughs> I don't. I actually don't see racism everywhere, but I can tell you what I see. I can see oppression. Yeah. I see what it looks like when some people get it and others don't. And Jesus just happened to wire me to have an a extra sensory experience every time I see it. And I'm like, oh, we got to do something about that. Yeah. We have the wharf, we have the weapons that God has already used on our behalf through Jesus Christ. It is God who ultimately will rout all the systems of this world. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is God who ultimately will level the playing field for every human being. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God is asking the new humanity who say they believe in Jesus by faith mm. to check ourselves mm. to see if we are complicit in supporting the systems of this world instead of being resistant to the systems of this world. And so we are to stand. (laughs) We are to pray. We are to intercede. You have situations in in your family. When was the last time you prayed? When was the last time you fasted and prayed? When was the last time you did a Jericho walk? Where you just walked around, shh. <laughs> and on the seventh day, you shouted, God, do something. Mm. The principalities and powers have already lost. Mm. We win. And we get to live now in abundance. Paul is in prison when he writes this letter. Paul is imprisoned because Paul has no problem identifying the fact that Rome, the system in Rome, the empire of Rome, Mm. couldn't shut him up Mm. because he came to talk about a Jesus who had a whole new system that did turn the world upside down. And who did God use to turn the world upside down? Some fishermen, Mm. uneducated. You know, they were circumcised, but outside of that, I mean, they couldn't trace their family back to anybody. (laughs) But this is who Jesus used. So if Jesus can use them, he can use us. If Jesus can use them, he can use us. Is it scary? Uh Uh-huh, for sure. Who wants to be the one? We don't mind talking about pork. (laughs) But we're not going to talk about sexism. We don't mind telling people we don't drink. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying. We pick and choose the things we want to because that's what we've been taught to do. But I came by to tell you this resurrection weekend that we have been invited to come back to the heart of worship. And if we're coming back to the heart of worship, we must know the one we worship. And we must be like the one we worship. And we have the power we need. The fight is fixed. We already win. That's how I want to end our time together. We need to armor up, y'all. We need to put the armor of God on. Every day you get up, every day you walk out the house, may I get my things, please? We got to armor up. We got to be ready. So this is what the Lord woke me up with this morning. Um, I need, yes. No, the chair is not going to fit. So I need somebody to be my assistant. Can I get an I want to be Vanna White. Make it an assistant, please. Come on up, my friend. Here we go. Put out, give our, give our, our. So.
What I'm about to demonstrate to you is not my idea. Um, an older gentleman who spent his whole life thinking about how to form leaders spiritually. He was in the hospital when God gave this image to him. What is this? <laughs> what do you call the container? A what? I want you to call it a pitcher. <laughs> it just works better. It rolls off the tongue better. So what is this? Pitcher. A pitcher. This is a... Very good. It's a cup. Now, this was supposed to be a saucer. I know it's a bowl, but we're at camp. Okay? So this is a saucer. Everybody say saucer. saucer. And this is a plate. All right, here we go. Pitcher, cup, saucer, plate. You are the cup. I am the cup. The saucer is your family, the people you're in your immediate circle of influence. The plate is your work, your community, and the world. The cup is what? Me. What is the saucer? Family, immediate circle of influence. What's the plate? This picture represents God. Every day, God is pouring out. What happens? And what happens? So if God is pouring into us, does our family experience God? What happens to the places of influence? You get the point. Thank you. Give him, a, give him a hand. God shows up every single morning we wake up. God's posture is always, let me pour. Let me borrow the cup real quick. Yeah. If I show up like this, is God still pouring? Is God still pouring? If the saucer is under me and the plate is under me, will they experience God? Yes, because God is still pouring. But I won't be a part of it. And the amount of God they receive is going to look different. Y'all want to see this physics? Empty those things real quick, please. Just because y'all, y'all, y'all not with me. Yeah, just empty those out. Yeah, please, real quick. My, my assistant, come on back. <laughs> I just want you to hold this for me. Yeah, you do? Oh, then go. Okay. So God is still going to pour. This will get filled. But look what happens. Physics, what happens? Is it consistent? Are they going to get as much as they could? No. If something happens and the cup is turned sideways and God pours, <laughs> God is still pouring. Thank you, my love. You can go. God is always going to pour. But you and I, the new humanity, yeah. will miss out on what God wants to do in and through us. Because our cups are turned upside down or turned sideways. Now, can we have a real conversation? Stuff happens. Things happen that cause us to turn our cups upside down. Sometimes our cups have cracks in them. Hmm? But here's the good news about God. Just turn your cup up. You know what happens over time? Those cracks get sealed. You know what happens over time? You get healed because you'll see God. You're receiving God's grace, God's goodness, God's love. And you're going to see it change your family. You're going to see it change the people around you. And you're going to participate in this good work of God. Listen, I'm going home. Y'all yeah. might think that's why I'm excited. That's not. <laughs> I'm excited because this Jesus that I keep telling you about is, is all the world to me. Yeah. Has changed my life. That good, good father song, worship team, y'all can come up. That good, good father, no, no, because we have questions for you. The good, good father song 
Lorraine, when you talked about it this morning, I thought I need to tell y'all a story. My dad is right now dealing with stage four cancer. I found this out about a month ago. I haven't lived with my father since I was nine. If I was dependent on my daddy to know who God was, I would never follow God. And I love my father. I love my father with the kind of love of a child who just desperately wants to know that she matters and that she is seen and she is enough. And my daddy could not and to this day cannot give that to me. He can't. And so I started asking questions, Lorraine, about my dad. Actually, my mama started telling me things, and because I was that kind of child, I was putting things together. My dad is the 11th of 17 pregnancies his mama had. Yeah. Y'all, 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 see, this is why the story matters. Because when we see people, we tell ourselves we know who they are. And we think we understand. So my dad is 17 of is 11 of 17 pregnancies, my mother, my grandmother, and she was pregnant 18 times. She had one stillbirth. And we're talking about post-colonial Jamaica. Right? My father grew up poor. I didn't even understand how poor they were. Until my cousin filled me in in October. I have an auntie who had a scar. And she said, do you know how our auntie got that scar? I was like, no. And because over time the Holy Spirit began to heal the cracks in my heart, I remember saying to God one day, I need you to be my daddy. Because I love the one that I have, but he just, if I look at him, it just doesn't make any sense. And God healed my heart. And it was painful. Thank you. And I'm telling you this story because I don't want you to walk away from here, go home and look back and go, man, it was great to be at big camp. I want you to go home and get to work. I want you to go home knowing that God's spirit is going to be pouring out every single day. And all we need to do is show up. Just show up. What does show up looking like? Open your eyes in the morning and go, hey, God, you ain't got to do nothing else. And you know what happens over time? Over time, it goes from, hey, God, to let me sit with you, God. It goes from, hey, God, to, oh, let me, let me listen to the scriptures. It, it goes from that to you starting to see where the spirit is moving and God starts putting people in your life who can walk with you, who will encourage you with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and people will trust you with their stories and they will tell you their truth. And when they tell you, you shut up yeah. and you listen. You don't have to agree. Just believe us when we tell you we hurt. Believe us when we tell you that we know you didn't mean to do what you did most of the time. We go through life like bulls in china shops. We, we're hurting people and we hurt other people. And in church we do it really well because we do it in the name of Jesus. The Lord told me to tell you. The Lord didn't tell you nothing. My sister. Ah, my brother. Ah. I'm excited to serve a God that is concerned with every human person on this planet. I'm excited to serve a God who is concerned about how I feel about how I look today, as well as my health. I, I'm excited to serve a God who, when he looked at this child who was damaged and hurt by adults, 
that he came along and said, you are my beloved. You matter and I see you. I can heal you. I stand here serving out of my brokenness that God turned around. You want to know why I'm so passionate? Because it could have been me. Because it was me. And the, when you don't have that kind of passion, it's not because you're not an extrovert. Perhaps it's because you've not had an experience yet to cause you to realize what it's like to be out. So here's your challenge. Haley, we have questions for them, yeah? yeah? We have some questions for you to think about, to talk to each other, and then at the end, I would like to make a call. So Haley, would you come and take us through what the thing is we're going to do? I've already warned you, I'm going to make a call. I warned you, I'm going to make a call. Y'all can get rebaptized wherever you want. My, the call that I'm going to give is not, that's part of it, but I'm going to make a call. Just, I told her. Not manipulating you, I told you up front. Okay. In the space that you're in, we would love you to recalibrate with one another. The questions are on the screen. Use this time to reflect on these questions or reflect on what Delis has said and the call that she's made to us. Again, this is what you want this space to look like. If you just need to reflect on that on your own, please do that. If you have questions, be curious. Ask, that's what we've been called to do this weekend. So in this next couple of minutes, just have a chat to the person next to you if that's what you want to do and talk through these questions and things that Dillis has spoken to us about today.
Are coming to a close. We have showers of blessings outside. privilege to have been with you this week. 
Thank you, every single one of you, just for showing up every time. For those of you who came and spoke to me and said, hey, I don't like half of what you said. <laughs> Nobody did that. What people said was, you're making me cry and I don't like it. That's on brand for me. Just so you know. People typically will say, you made me cry, and I'm like, I actually didn't make you cry. I was just talking about some things and then you got you cried. But that's, that's, that's okay. Listen. When I tell you that I love you with the love of Jesus, when I tell you that I leave my family to do these things because of Jesus, I am compelled to do this work. And I thank you for being willing to sit and listen to this little old Jamaican girl. Right? I, 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 wanted, I want you to know that I see you. I know this is hard for you. I know that I have said things that you are not comfortable with. I know there are things I have touched on your sacred cows. I know that your theology is so set and there are people who have, you said it to me and I'm, I'm good with that. That's the reason I'm a Christian Seventh-day Adventist because we talk back. I want you to prove me wrong. I want you to go home. I want you to pick up your Bibles. I want you to read the scriptures. I want you to search. I want you to look up words. You've heard me use a lot of words. Look them up. I've mentioned some books. Read them. And when you're uncomfortable, pay attention to your discomfort and ask yourself, why am I uncomfortable? When I'm uncomfortable, when I'm frustrated, it's usually at the moment of transition into new understanding. Yeah. Have you ever met somebody you just didn't like them? In, in my culture, I am a spirit and a tech them. My spirit, I'm going to agree with them. That's what we would say in my culture. And you know what the Holy Spirit has done to me? When people, I don't, when I meet them and I'm like, man, the spirit will go, get ready. I'm like, oh, come on. And he's like, get ready. Something's about to happen. And it usually means I get stretched and I make a relationship, a friendship that is just one I could not have made it through life without. Here is the call that I want to make. I'm looking for some people who are willing and ready to let God use them to tear down the kingdom of darkness. Come on. It's scary. Because our theology says, I don't want the darkness to know that I'm coming. <laughs> because I don't want the darkness to come get me. Am I telling the truth or what? It's true. That's how we've been socialized. Like, we don't want to speak truth to power. We don't want to call things out because we don't want it to pay attention to us. But here's the deal. We serve a God. This is what we say we believe, that we serve a God who when the forces of darkness determined to take us out, said, put me in, coach. I'm going in, and this is how I'm going to go in. I made them. I'm going to become one of them. People who follow Islam don't even understand what we're talking about. They're like, he's a prophet. We got you. Mm. But this business about him being a god, come on. Yeah, right. They're like, that don't make sense. And if all we're doing is waiting for the earth made new yes. to prove to people, then we miss the assignment. Yeah. The assignment is this. The kingdom of heaven is it's here, here now. So we're just looking for a few good people. Yeah. I'm, the, I'm making a play on the movie. Yeah. A few good men. <laughs> My age. Okay. Millennials are like, what? We're just looking for some people who are willing to begin engaging in the conversations about the kingdom and asking the question, how come it's not happening where we are? The questions that we had up there, I was asking you about, what do you do when you're in a space where you're not respected and loved? Do you leave? Or do you stay and say, hey, 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 something's not right. And I'm going to tell you, it's hard work, it's messy work, it is, it is, it is, it is draining work. Unless you follow Jesus, who would spend the whole, the whole day with people 
giving and giving and giving, and then he would go off to a quiet place and connect with the Father. Remember that Jesus did not have the scriptures the way we have the scriptures. They were in scrolls, and if he was a good Jewish boy, he would have memorized the Psalms. This is why I'm telling you, y'all, what we're trying to do is not rocket science. It's been going on a long time. We just walked away from it. So we got to come back to the scripture. Stop arguing about which version is the holiest version. Read the version that makes the most sense to you. And the Bible teaches us that when we read the scripture, we should pray to the spirit to give us understanding. So does it matter what translation you're reading? Because it's telling me the spirit doesn't have power over the words of human beings. Stop it. So that's your individual time with God. And then what would it look like in the family of God, the, the new human, made up of this multi-ethnic, multi-generational set of people? We gather together and we start to talk to one another about what God has been doing and what God has been saying. And then you start to find the people who God is moving on in the same way. If you're a shy person and you can't stand in front of people and you don't want to do a Bible study, I'm going to give you one of my favorite examples to give. But you know an extroverted person or another introverted person who loves to think and read scriptures. Partner with them. And start having people to your house. That means you can't keep working to make sure you have a fancy house. Just be settled with the house you have. And when people come and they judge you, tell them it's okay. You just want to make room for them to come. Do what Jesus did. Eat with people. Invite them over. Learn to eat spicy food. Hallelujah. (laughs) Discover what you have in common with people from different parts of the world. Learn new music. Learn how to dance. One of the things in the health message we don't talk about is dancing. And I promise you, have you seen the Africans? When they're not around you, uh, they dance so. And I wish you would try to do that and have your knees not hurt. And they tell me as we get older, Karen, we need to learn how to get up and sit down. So squats are important. So if we dance with the Africans, you see that? We're going to be all right. We need to do that more. Laugh. We don't laugh with each other. And we also need to hold space for people who are hurting. Stop saying happy Sabbath and walking past people and actually asking them, how are you doing? And if they look sad, don't rush them out of your sadness because you're uncomfortable. Because we make it about us all the time. Instead say, I don't really want to be sad right now, but it seems you want to be sad, I'm here. because of these little computers and we are the loneliest that we've ever been. Make that make sense. That's where the new humanity comes in because we have what everybody wants. Lorraine said it to me. Y'all hear me calling on Lorraine. I feel like Lorraine is my child. Her and Brian, I met them before they even were a thing. I knew they should have been a thing before they knew they should have been a thing. sharing about with me about just some reflections that she's having around how she's engaging with other people and one of the things she shared was that she's realizing that the people she works with don't have what she has she takes it for granted that she has a choir a singing group and she has people she can hang out with on the weekends and and she can go to church and there are people around her am I I quoting you correct who are just like "What, what is that Victoria, are you ready? 
Are you ready? You know? I'm ready. You ready? I'm always ready. God has some things for us to do. It is scary and exciting. It is challenging and exciting. It makes me anxious and excited. It gives me hope. So if that's something you want to do, I want to invite you to stand. And I'm going to pray over you. to end today and I put the music team on this the musos as you say on the spot but I want if you've not heard it before um, I would like you to learn it um, if you said it we believe it you're a man of your word that's the chorus that's all you're gonna sing if you said it, we believe it, because you're a man of your word. If you said it, say after me, if you said it, we believe it, because you're a man of your word. If you said it, we believe it, because you're a man of your word. Let me do the verse. you will go ahead of them, that you will restore them, that you will heal them, that you will comfort them, that you will vindicate them. God, there are others of us in this space. We have been challenged. We're still challenged. We, we are asking questions. We're feeling some kind of way. We're feeling shame. We're feeling guilt. We're feeling, man, I could have been doing more. I, what did I do wrong? God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would touch every person having those feelings right now and give them peace instead. Give them hope instead. Help them to believe that they are forgiven if they confess their sins and help them to receive that forgiveness before they leave this tent. God, there are others of us in this space. We are hyped. We want to do the thing. But we know that our armor 
has holes and cracks. We know that we're not consistent in our study of scripture. We know that our prayer life could, could do use a little work. <laughs> we know that when it comes to the body of Christ, that we're ambivalent because we've not experienced the new family and the new humanity. Spirit of the living God, I ask you to come in and make amends, bring healing, give us courage, give us hope. Spirit of the living God, I pray that you would do something that's so transformative for every single person under the sound of my voice. That when we go home and people ask us, how was Big Camp? We can say we met Jesus and we signed up again. We want to be a part of this new humanity. We're learning how to put off the old and take on the new. We're learning how to trust the spirit and be led by the spirit. We're learning how to fight in the armor of God. And, and there's some systems we need to take on as God leads us. Will you come with me? God, I pray for the children who have been here. I pray the seeds of your word would find soil and grow. I pray you would help us as adults to be good stewards of the lives that are in our care. Jesus, you know that I am longing for you to shut this system of darkness down. Like, I, Jesus, I just want this earth to be the way it was supposed to be from the beginning. Jesus, I want to walk with you and talk with you in the cool of the evening. God, God, I, I want us to be in a world where we see sunrises that take our breaths away and we know that everybody who's hungry is going to be fed and we know there will be no sickness or disease and there will be no poverty, God. I'm looking for that world. And while we wait, help us to address poverty and sickness and disease. Help us in your name, Jesus, to fight against rulers and, and, and the spiritual challenges that, that bring this darkness on the planet. And help us to know that you are with us through it all. And Jesus, <laughs> should I not meet my brothers and sisters in the form that I'm in again? anytime soon. I'm t I want you to remind them they can find me by the mango tree in the earth made new. And they can come and we can hang out and we can talk about what you unleashed in and through us as people who have desired to follow and live and be like Jesus. If you are someone who wants to rededicate your life to God, if you want to get rebaptized, there's a bunch of pastors here that can help you figure that out. If the Spirit has moved on you to do that, please do that. God, we thank you. Help us to believe that you are a God that keeps your word. And the resurrection power of Jesus is the deposit that we are all holding on. Because you indeed are a God of your word. God bless you, each and every one of you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen and amen. Amen. to welcome you to um, keep worshiping with us.
is all creation groaning is a new creation coming is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves of this it is is anyone worthy is anyone whole is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessing?
mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry. We don't want to go, right? But we still want to go. But what a way to actually end. We want to cry holy, 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 and continue to fall down at the feet of Jesus. And then we pray, God, we promise that we will go and love our communities and our families well. Uh, when you said it, we believe it because you are a man of your word. Hallelujah and amen. So church, go. Go and transform the communities and the churches that you belong to. Go and love on your family. But before you go, we want you to help us stack the chairs because that's a way that you get to love us well as well. So um, I know that we, you want to get into your cars and you want to get out of here um, before you get caught in the storm. But we would love it if you could help us uh, stack the chairs to 18 high and then we will take care of it from, from here on in. But thank you. If you want to hang out, hang out.